you find yourself lost in Irving Land. Switch the reserve fuel cells for firing check. Wrong? Looks like impurities in the reserve fuel system. We're going to try a short blast at maximum thrust to clean them out. Now stand by below. Impurities? They may be noxious fumes. I must get my gas mask. That routine burn test will set off a chain of events that leads to our story today. But I want to take a moment to talk about something else. Their outfits. These two haven't really changed much, if at all, from last season. And since the first season wasn't in color, as far as we know, this is how they've always looked. This bunch, on the other hand, are supposed to be a little more psychedelic, more in line with the rising tide of the late 60s. I don't know where they got their definition of psychedelic from, but they should have looked elsewhere. Dr. Smith is nice and bland in dark blue, while the rest are adorned in varying shades of purple, yellow, and puke green. Maureen and Will aren't bad, but that thing Judy is wearing looks like it belongs on a ten-year-old. And I swear Penny is wearing a maternity dress. I doubt she would have any use for one since the only prospects for a father are Don and Dr. Smith. Don has already spoken for If he knocks anybody up, it'll be Judy. And Dr. Smith? Ugh. To try and burn out those impurities, they initiate a maximum forward thrust for one minute. Must be getting close to the speed of light. What if you're a bass? <laughs> I think Debbie speaks for everybody, Smith. Shut up and hang on. 58, 9, 1 minute. Power off! It's not responding. We're still at maximum acceleration. The continued acceleration will take them well beyond the speed of light, whereupon there's a loud bang and everyone loses consciousness. And then... Creatures from the planet Numero appeared and took them captive. Dr. Smith wakes up first, but can't rouse anybody else. He's close to panic. So, situation normal. Ah! Good heavens, what is this? A manta ray? A giant squeak? Correction, I am a robot, as you will plainly see if you will remove your gas mask. It's all your fault, you computerized card. What is all his fault? that you forgot you put a gas mask on or he's better recovered than you are. As the rest of the people wake up, the robot reports that exceeding light speed sent them into a space war. It's brought them to somewhere familiar. Professor Major, you're alive, thank heaven. He says it's Earth, but I don't believe it. Oh, don't torment me, it's an illusion, a mirage, a doomed man's apparition. No, Smith, that's no apparition. That's our solar system, and that's Earth. Everyone is suited up and prepared for re-entry, but something weird is going on. Alpha Control, this is the Jupiter 2, come in. Come in, Alpha Control, this is Jupiter 2, preparing for re-entry, come in. No luck. No. We've tried every possible radio beam frequency we have. Also all the power we've got. They can't raise anybody on the radio. Nobody has an explanation, so there's nothing for it but to land and go find out what's going on. I can smell pine and fresh water. A pond or a lake. It smells like burning leaves like fog. Do you feel cold? Just, just happy. Man-made buildings. And look over there, I can see the glow of lights from the city. I think they're trying to tell us they don't know where they landed. How the bibbity-bobbity does that work? They have full control over that ship, unlike the capsules we were using in the 60s, where we had to try and calculate where to re-enter so they landed in the ocean somewhere. These guys have the ability to land anywhere they want to, so you'd think they'd want to go back to their original launching pad where Alpha Control is supposed to be. How is it possible they don't know where that is? A parking area by the look of it. Yeah. Did you check our Earth calendar? As best I could. Give or take a week or two, it's the month of October, the Earth year 1999. He calculated that based on how long they've been gone, but there's a few things he didn't take into consideration.
We'll find out later that they're not even sure what that thing is. Maureen has vague memories of pictures where people were using them, but she has no idea what to do with it. They start back to the ship. Last time I saw a car like this, it was in a museum. What's it doing here? Beats me. Don, look at this. Well, I was right. In Michigan. The year. 47. 1947. That's right, he forgot to take the space warp into account. They're on Earth all right, 50 years in the past. He turns the car radio on. After the tubes warm up, which should tell him something is very wrong here, he hears something distressing. This is emergency station MTG. All listeners are urged to stay tuned to this station for full minute-by-minute -minute reports on the grave situation which now faces this area. At 2.35 this morning, an unidentifiable flying object was seen in the skies above Lake Superior. At the same time, all power and communication within a 200-mile radius of station MTG failed. Something about their re-entry knocked out all the electricity in the area. The locals are convinced aliens have landed. All citizens capable of bearing arms are urged to report at once to the home of Joseph Cragmeyer on Willow Lane, Manitou Junction. It is believed that the occupants of the unidentified object are dangerous emissaries of a world not our own. Get everyone back on this ship and leave. Now! The guy on the radio just confirmed that the year is 1947. Leave at once. To make the situation perfect, they landed in the middle of backwoods one-tooth redneck country where we get our scientific information from, well, you'll see. Hold it, Charlie. If you shoot at them two, you're going to have a whole slew of them piling out of that there blimp. How many do you reckon there are, Grover? Could be a whole army of them. What they're made of, they don't take up no room. A Tales of Tomorrow story I was reading said they ain't nothing but electric shatters. Tales of Tomorrow was actually a TV show that didn't appear until 1951, but there were tons of science fiction comics, pulp novels, magazines, you name it. So if you come up with some combination of words that sounds weirdly sciency or futuristic, the title probably existed for at least a couple of issues. The important thing to know here is, this guy got all that information from a comic book. They are now Voltones, whether they are or not. Volton Smith is having his usual delusions of grandeur when our two skilled, experienced alien hunters take them captive. Exactly how they tried to hoodwink folks in that there story, Charlie. This here Valtone's a young'un, Grover. Hey, that hurts. Don't hang him, sir. You ain't an electric shatter. Of course not. I'm human. That's our spaceship over there. Look, I know we've been away for a long time, but you must have heard of the Jupiter, too. Through a series of miscommunications, Will and Dr. Smith grasped not only where they are, but when. 1950 ain't for three years yet. What? Do you mean to say that this is 19... 46? 47's what it is. Did that comic book happen to mention whether or not Voltones can count? Still, since they aren't electric shadows and talk just like regular people, our two intellectuals are starting to believe these guys are human. Please believe us, sir. We're from Earth. We are. We are. All personnel report back to the Jupiter immediately. Don't come no closer or I'll shoot. Don't threaten him, sir. He might blast you. I ain't afraid of no Valtones. I suggest we leave before those jokers really get me riled up. Or not. He can't say Will didn't warn him, but I do wonder how it doesn't occur to either him or Dr. Smith that these 1947 night watchmen at a rural sawmill have no idea what a robot is. Next question, what's it going to take to fix that divot in the robot's shell? Hush, Nini, you know perfectly well who I am. Not much, I guess. Maybe he's self-healing, and it didn't even leave a scar. Too bad I hear robot chicks dig scars. All right, let's have a little discipline around here. Come on. <coughs> Fall in right along there. I can't say for sure, because 1947 is even before my time, but I think that may be some variation of a Boy Scout uniform. Anybody either older than me or more versed in such lore, please correct me. He insists on being called Captain Cragmire, not Joe, and he's the leader of this little band of ignoramuses. Ignoramite. 
ignoramicals. They have no idea what they're doing, but he has the biggest lack of information, so he's in charge. We seen them, Joe! Them Voltoons! Two of them come snooping around the sawmill. Call me Captain. Yes, you Captain. Me, Grover. What'd they look like? Well, uh, they fixed up their faces look like us, but they couldn't do nothing about their bodies. Their skin's all silvery like the underside of a speckled trout. With a natural zipper growing out of their neck, too. These guys are too dim to be believable. For me, I mean. I know they're supposed to be stereotypes, and stereotypes exist for a reason, but even though, they should know that even Voltones don't come with a built-in zipper. Tell him about the big fella, Grover, the one with the electric shooting iron. He was their leader, I reckon. Lightning come out of his arms. We both was hit. You should have seen him, Joe. I mean, Captain. Head big as a rendering bat. Arms big enough around like a honey locust tree. And a body the size of an elephant. All silvery, just like the others. Charged with electricity like a power station. Shooting at him didn't do no good. We stayed out there till it was light. That big fella's still out there. Either he's never seen an actual elephant, or the robot needs to go on a diet. They formulate a plan to lure a couple of the aliens out, then rope them and knock them out with insulated pipe wrenches since they're obviously full of electricity. Back on the ship, Dr. Smith is determined that he's going to stay here, use his knowledge of the future, and basically rule the world. It won't occur to him that if he does that and so thoroughly alters the timeline, there's a good chance he won't even exist. He smells power and wealth and he's following his nose the way he always does. This area is off limits to all Jupiter personnel until further notice. For your information, I am no longer a member of the Jupiter Menage. My destiny is clear. It lies yonder among the worthy citizens of this backward civilization, which will, of course, develop rapidly under my guidance. This backward civilization just won a world war against a couple of hellish tyrants, and they did it without your help. I think they'll be fine, and you can bet that before long, they'll have captured themselves a Volton. I'm looking for Dr. Smith. Have you seen him? I have seen the former Dr. Smith. The former? He has returned to the fifth decade of the 20th century to fish for oysters. You mean he went into town? Affirmative. I'd better go get him back. Come on, you'd better come with me. My orders are to... Well, this order supersedes all previous orders. Now let's go. I'm reminded of Pilot in the final season of Farscape. He finally got tired of everyone giving him orders and begged them to elect a captain so he only had a single voice in his head. In our first season here, the robot only responded to Dr. Smith. By the next season, he also responded to Will and sometimes Professor Robinson. This season, anybody can give him an order and override someone else's. That has to get confusing. Meanwhile, Judy and Penny have slipped over to a nearby orchard to pick a few apples for their trip. With permission, unlike Dr. Smith and Will. And the robot. Speaking of whom... Dr. Smith! So, there you are, you catapulting clown. I see you've changed your mind about joining me. I knew you would. Will says, no, that's not it. We came to take you back. Smith says, nothing doing. I'm staying here. Have them, boys. Here they are, boys. I caught them for you. Warning, warning. Warning. There we are. Hey, Turtle, let me go. Let me go. Let me go. Forgive me, William, but I had to do this for your own good. Of course, of course, for your own good. You being Zachary Smith, naturally, since he's never done anything for anybody's good but his own. I've lost count of how many times he's betrayed Will now, and we know that dingy kid will keep coming back for more. The littlest Voltone has a visitor. You can come a little closer. I mean, I'm not going to bite you or anything. You don't look very dangerous. I'm not dangerous. Neither is he. But your Voltones. Voltones can assume any shape they like. They can even speak our language. That's what Mr. Grover told my father. Ask Mr. Grover where he got that information. You're going to love the answer. Will can't convince her that he's human. But I am human. I am. I am. I am. I am. Forget it, Will. If a childish temper tantrum like that won't convince her you're a typical icky human boy, nothing will. Yeah, I don't mean my just turning up on these here extraterrestrial phenomena. I reckon I can handle most of them. Uh, where did you say you was from, uh, Chief? Chickasaw Falls, Captain. Got me a good look at their vehicle and my astral telescope. I knew they'd be landing here, so I figured I'd just mosey on over, give you all a hand. Considering that accent, he must be in southern Michigan. 
They were impressed enough with the way he disabled the robot that they're willing to put him in charge of everything. His first task? Interrogate the prisoner. Poor dear William. It cuts me to the quick to see you in such a predicament. But until you can face things realistically, you must be treated as an alien. It's you who aren't facing things realistically, Dr. Smith. You saw what he did with the robot's power pack. William, if you will promise to give me your full support and cooperation. Dr. Smith, please go away. You're beginning to bother me. Bother indeed. Mind your manners, William. You saw what he forgot to take with him in his state of high indignation. Will saw it too. Back at the sawmill, the girls have finished gathering apples. These apples are so good I could eat them all. Oh, we'll save some seeds and try growing them in the hydroponic garden. Hey, you're a girl. What did you think I was, some kind of a zombie? Well, aren't you? She tries to explain that she's as human as he is, and please take this rope off her neck. You know, you speak so natural-like. I could almost believe you. Apples. Oh, now, now don't tell me you Voltones eat those things. Of course we do. And we're not Voltones. We're people, just like the rest of you. Penny runs into the ship and reports Judy's capture. Judy isn't making much progress with this guy. Good apples. Where'd you get them? Over there. Oh, Ed Jensen's place. It's lucky he didn't catch you. Oh, is it any better being caught by you? Please, you know I'm being truthful. You've got to let me go. I have orders to bring you in alive. But if you give me any trouble, I'll... All right, stop it! Stop it. This guy is what happens when cousins marry. John says, someone here also has my little boy. You have one hour to get him back here to me so we can leave. If he's not back by then, we'll come into town with lasers worse than these. Now, the laser wouldn't be invented until 1958, so he has no idea what John said, but it sounded ominous enough that he's taking it seriously. The Voltones want their youngin' back or they're coming into town with fire-breathing ladles or something like that. I still didn't understand why you decided I wasn't dangerous. I didn't. The Major said it was all right for me to feed you. The Major? The Fire Chief. He's the one in charge of all the vigilantes now. Figures. Will tries to explain that he's really Dr. Smith and he belongs with them. But like most kids his age, he goes into way too much detail and makes her head swim. You mean he's a Voltone too? Of course not. There's no such thing as a Voltone. Don't you understand? You don't understand, do you? I'm not sure why there's no such thing as Voltones didn't register with her. It's just about the first thing he said that's somewhere near her age level. He gives her a gemstone that he found on another planet. If I do believe you and you really are telling the truth, we can never meet. At least not for real. Oh, that's all right. You can keep that. That'll prove we met for real. The more he tries to explain, the worse it gets. When they're done eating, she's sorry, but she has to tie him up again. Joe! Joe! Joe, you got one of their youngins here? Well, we got two of them under arrest, if that's what you mean. Well, if they don't get their youngin' back right away, they're gonna come here and blast Man at Two Junction right off the face of the map. Now, that's what they told me. Captain, round up your men. We march at once. Our mission is target Jupiter. Yes, sir! Yep, he'll let them destroy the ship and the Robinsons if it gets him what he wants assuming they have the capability to destroy the ship. What do they have that can do that? They have a 19th century cannon. I hope they didn't borrow it from F Troop. Led by the eternally posturing Smith, they say, you have one hour to come out and surrender or we destroy the ship. But I want to back up a few frames for just a moment to talk about something else. I mentioned that I wondered whether Billy Mummy practiced those facial expressions or if they came naturally. I wondered the same about this little gesture from Guy Williams. We've seen it several times. Now here it is, old Jupiter 2 personnel. This is an ultimatum. You have five minutes to lay down your weapons and surrender. 
that little shift of his weight, crossing his arms, the whole thing says, you've got to be kidding, and he uses it with Dr. Smith a lot. Practiced or natural? I don't know. What do you think? John says, if you destroy the ship, you do it with us in it. If you're prepared to go that far, so be it. Smith orders the men to arrest him. After some gyrations and a fair bit of hopping, Will manages to restore the robot's power. His new friend helps him and the robot sneak through town and get back to the ship. Halt! Where do you kids think you're going? Your father gives strict orders. All women and children got to stay indoors till the emergency's over, Stacy. This is an emergency, too. Mr. Grover, we have to plant the scarecrow in Daddy's cornfield, or there won't be any corn come harvest time. Well, hurry it up, then. Clever idea, putting the scarecrow on wheels so you don't have to lug it around all over the place. With no other options, Don and the others have brought their guns out and are vacating the ship. John already sussed out why Smith isn't willing to stay by himself and let them go. He's afraid of being alone. And since he's the center of the universe, they should be only too happy to sacrifice their futures to assuage his fears. Don't! Don't shoot! Stacy, what are you doing here? You get on home right away, do you hear? You can't blow up their ship, Daddy. It's all they've got to get back where they belong. Nonsense. They belong here with me. Do you really want to belong here, Dr. Smith? Indeed I do. It's a far side better than anything out there. Out where, Chief? Stand by your gun, Cragmire. I'll handle the tones. He's thrown half a dozen hints their way, and they haven't caught one yet. If only Cragmire had a catcher's mitt. Nothing is going to deter Dr. Smith or the chief or the major or whoever he is from destroying the ship. If you're that sure about it, I'll take the chance and stay here with you, provided you let everyone go and don't blow up the Jupiter. Except that. Smith says, it's a deal. Cragmire, the mission is scrubbed. Oh, now look, Chief, you mean you're going to let these Valtones go after what you said they could do for Manitou Junction? We don't need them. Yes, we do. <laughs> Smith was having visions of grandeur in the form of something resembling a theme park built around the aliens that would put this town on the map. At least I think that's what he was describing. He spent most of that part of the exposition talking about how great it would be for him. Whatever it was, Cragmire isn't letting go of it. He says, fire. I saw the smoke, but I don't see much fire. In the confusion, John grabs a laser rifle while the others pile into the ship, Will included. You think we're photons, aliens? Well, if that's what you believe, that's what we are. I won't try to change your minds. Let's just say that we came here, and when we found out we didn't belong, we left. I think I might have put it in somewhat nastier terms. We came in peace. You treated us like crap without knowing anything about us. Everything you thought you knew about us, you got from a frickin' comic book. So we took all the cool things we could have shared with you, and... We left. But that's just me. That's the way they feel about it, Chief. We'd better let them all go, huh? Oh, but don't you worry. I'll give you a ride back to your firehouse and chicken soft balls. Chicken soft balls, indeed! Wait for me! Hey, hey, you daffy! Come back! Come back! If it was me, when I saw him coming, I'd start raising the rent just so I get to watch him scramble up onto it. But I'm a much bigger you-know-what than John Robinson is. Well, I, I can't say exactly what it looked like. Kind of a, well, kind of like a plate or a saucer. Yeah, yeah, that's what you'd call it, a flying saucer. Yeah, yes, sir. Couldn't be anything to what they said about being human beings like us. Could it, Craig? I don't know, Stacy. I just don't know. But whichever, I don't guess we'll ever hear no flying saucers anymore. Perish the thought. Americans are way too smart to fall for that stuff. Small tunes ain't gonna drop him off at Chickasaw Falls. 35 years later, just shy of his 100th birthday, Cragmire figured it out. I'll see you next time you find yourself lost in Irving Land. If you enjoyed this episode, click the like button and let us know. Be sure to subscribe and click the bell so you always know what is happening. Because something is always happening here at Irving Zoo. We make sure of it. We control his computer. Until next time.